Good evening. Today is the 25th of January of 2015. This is Pastor Barbara, a.k.a. Preacher with Parrots. We are in the book of Ephesians, and we are in chapter 4. I'm looking at my clock. That's why I'm looking up this way. I was hoping to get chapters 4, 5, and 6 done tonight. Now yeah, maybe we'll get 4 and 5. Paul um, has been talking, explaining to the Gentiles about how God has called him especially to minister to the Gentiles and how no other generation of people lived in a time quite like this. We're going to start in chapter 4. And he talks about the unity, but the diversity, the differentness in the body of Christ. Some being Jews, some being Gentiles. There's other differences beside that. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, urge, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you've received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, accepting one another with love, diligently, keeping the unity of the Spirit with the peace that binds us. That's three verses. Verses 1 through 3. He says, you all have been called to walk in the Spirit. I would like you to see, to live worthy of this. So that there's one body and one spirit. We Christians are referred to as the body of Christ. All together we are the bride of Christ. And he is the bridegroom who, according to John 14, is off preparing a house for his bride. That's what bridegrooms did. They made contracts with the fathers of the brides. And the fathers would prepare whatever gift or dowry they were going to give. And another one of their responsibilities was to keep their daughters pure so that when they got married, they would be virgins. And then the father of, of the bride, in addition to keeping the bride pure and anticipating her wedding day and her union with her bride is so similar to we as Christians, the bride of Christ. It's our job to keep ourselves pure so that when he comes for his church, and as I said, according to John 14, uh, he is preparing for us a mansion. Guys didn't get married in those days as young as they usually do now. But they were expected to have a home, uh, a business, or a trade, some way of providing for a family. And the girls were often 14, 15 years old when they got married. They had no education. They weren't going to school. If they were old enough to keep house, wash clothes, cook food, have babies, and care for them and care for their husband, that's what life was like. And so the bride would keep herself pure and the bridegroom would prepare to take care of the bride after their union. And we Christians that make up the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, are supposed to be keeping ourselves pure, preparing for our encounter with the Lord when he returns. Um, verse 7. I want, let me go back to verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, 
one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above us and through all in all. Now, grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Messiah's gift. Jesus has given us a gift. And in verse 8 it says, For he has ascended on high. He took prisoners into captivity. He gave gifts to people. Verse 9 says, What does he ascended mean? Except that he descended to the lower parts of hell, or to the lower parts of the earth. The one who descended, and I have an open Bible in front of me. The word one has a capital O that refers to a person, and that's referring to Jesus. Jesus is the one who descended into the earth. The one who descended is the same as the one who ascended into the heavens. This is some of the mystery of the body of Christ that he's explaining to them. We've talked before on this program about Sheol. It's sometimes translated hell. I don't use that translation because it's the same word as another place called hell that was prepared for the demons, the fallen angels, and for Satan or Lucifer. It's not talking about that hell. It is a place for departed spirits. It is a place where the spirits of those who have died go. Both the spirits of righteous and unrighteous people are there. It is called hell. Uh, the other name that I prefer is Shoal, S-H-O-E-L, uh, a name for a place where departed spirits who no longer had a body went. Jesus was there during the time or after his death until the moment of his resurrection. And he personally gave, let me back up, the one who descended is the same one who ascended above into the heaven that he might fill all things. After Jesus was on earth, after his resurrection, a total of 40 days had gone by. Jesus went out on the mount. His disciples and other loved ones were there. He gave his last word to them, which happened to be, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature in every language. He also added, and we have it not only in the gospels, but first chapter of Romans, of Acts, I believe. Wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued or filled with power from on high. In other words, what I refer to as the what and the how. Jesus is about to go back to heaven and be with his Father. The Holy Spirit is about to descend. See, first, and I made reference a little bit ago about uh, God dwelling in the Holy of Holies above the mercy seat. That's where his presence was. Jesus came. The angel said to Mary, you will name him Jesus. Emmanuel means God with us. Before, even though we know God is everywhere at all times, 
people knew that God was in the Holy of Holies. But now at the birth of Jesus, God is with us. Jesus is on earth, not as a spirit in a particular place where only the high priest can go. But now Jesus is walking the highways and the byways. He's eating meals. He's teaching. He has disciples, that is, students who follow him and are learning from him. And God now is with us as a human being. But now, Emmanuel is about to leave us. But he will not leave us without God. He is about to be taken into the heavenlies to go with God the Father. And as he is, God the Holy Spirit is going to come down. And now we've had God the Father, God the Son. Now God the Holy Spirit will come down to earth and be with us. God the Father was God a spirit. Emmanuel, Jesus, God the Son, had a physical body that people saw, recognized, touched, so forth. Now the Holy Spirit does not. We're, after 40 days that Jesus was on earth after his death, he ascended into heaven. And when he did, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And then he said, go in Jerusalem until you are given the power to go in all the world and preach the gospel. Springtime, you made it. I'm so glad. <laughs> How you doing? You okay? Um, we're in Ephesians 4. Now we're going to go to verse, um, so I'm going to read verse 10 again. The one who descended into Sheol, a place of spirits that no longer have physical bodies, far above the heavens, is the one who now ascends. He personally, now that he's going back to heaven, how are things going to be run on earth? Are we going to have priests? Are we going to have high priests? How are things going to be now? How is his church, the blood-bought redeemed, who is going to be their leaders and what is going to be their job? Verse 11, he personally gave some to be apostles. What are apostles? Our apostles are going to be... <laughs> apostles are going to be church leaders one of the requirements and so the disciples except for Judas Iscariot and he has now of course hung himself uh, they qualify they all saw Jesus after his death one that they voted for in Acts chapter 1 made him an apostle he qualifies Paul qualifies because he had an encounter with Jesus in Acts chapter 9. And beyond that, he went out into the desert for many years and had many personal encounters and revelations from Jesus. So he said he gave some apostles. By the way, some refer to this as a five-fold ministry. He gave some to be apostles, some prophets. What is a prophet? A prophet is one who speaks under a heavy anointing of the Holy Spirit. What he speaks might be teaching the word. It might be preaching the gospel. It might be telling something which has not yet happened. We tend to think of the Old Testament prophets of those telling things that are going to happen in the future. But that's what prophecy is. Um, remember when we were studying in the Corinthians, uh, the women were told if they were going to pray and prophesy in church, they should wear a head covering. Uh, that's an example. Uh, 
prophesying. Some evangelists, what do evangelists do? Evangelist is the name given to preachers or lay people who go to people that have never heard the gospel and teach it to them. Uh, well-known evangelist in our day is Billy Graham. He had one message. Come to Jesus. Be saved. Come to the cross. All the years that he preached. One message. Some pastors and teachers. What is a pastor? Another name for pastor is shepherd. Go out where the sheep are. Uh, sheep tend to be dumb sometimes. They'll follow a leader. They follow the wrong leader and somebody leads them the wrong way. Pastor's got to pull them back into the flock. If they stay behind when the shepherd is taking the whole group somewhere, Shepherds, pastor. And by the way, the word for shepherd in Spanish is pastor, and it's spelled exactly like pastor. Shepherds got to go get them, bring them back in. Take care of them in their daily life. Evangelists go get those that have never heard. Pastors, pastors have a more variety of responsibilities. They preach, they teach, they counsel, they pray for the sick, they perform most of the marriages, the funerals, they're just the shepherds, the teachers. Some of them teach in the church. And pastors are also teachers. And many pastors are also prophets. And many pastors are also evangelists. Being a pastor is a tremendous responsibility. And it's a beautiful ministry. Verse 12. For the training of the saints in the work of the ministry. So he's got apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Those five. And the purpose of their ministry is to train the saints. Who's the saint? Somebody that can prove he's done so many miracles? Well, in the New Testament, a saint is somebody who is a born-again Christian. He is somebody who has asked to have his sins forgiven, and now that his sins are forgiven, he's doing everything possible he can to live for God and please the Lord. So the shepherd looks after the saints. Uh, a teacher prepares the saints, all Christians, for the work of the ministry. Anybody who ministers is in the ministry. If somebody is bleeding and you clean the wound and put a bandage on it, you're ministering to them. If somebody is crying, sobbing, and you comfort them, you're ministering to them. So we have the title, ministers. But minister is a verb. And a lot of people, you don't have to have reverend in front of your name uh, in order to minister. We should all minister to those who need ministry. To build up the body of Christ. See, when we come to Christ, we become born again. That means we're new at this. We're little babies. We're dependent upon adults for everything. New babies don't know how to eat. We have to tell them, look, you buy yourself a Bible that you understand. You read a little every day. We have to teach them. Go to church, watch programs, buy the kind of books 
watch the kind of programs, whether television, internet, whatever, videos, that will help you grow up. You got to grow. You got to learn. You can't stick a quarter in us and we know stuff. You can't stick four quarters in us and we become mature. We become mature because more mature Christians are looking over us and helping us grow and teaching us. Until we reach the unity in the faith in the knowledge of God's Son. That's how we grow in our knowledge of the Lord. Uh, i got to move my Bible here so I don't have to look so far down to see it. Until we reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of God's Son, growing into a mature man with a stature measured by Christ's fullness, we're supposed to grow up and be Christ-like. Not supposed to be babies. Unfortunately, some saints are 50 years old and serving him that long. And they are as immature as they were the first year they were saved. Then we will no longer be children, tossed about by waves and blown around by every wind of teaching. See a child, you tell them, there's a bear in that room, and the kid says, <gasps> You tell a 21-year-old man, there's a bear in that room, and he says, yeah. Until they grow up. But when they're young, whatever anybody tells them, they believe it. See, they need this ministry. They need the pastors. They need the evangelist. They need the teacher. They need the prophet to help them grow. So that when the waves come, the waves don't knock them over. Because they're adults. If you're a kid, you get knocked over. If you don't grow in grace, if you don't mature as a Christian, you don't know any more than you did the day you first came to Jesus, you'll fall for anything. The mature Christian can stand his ground. We will no longer be little children tossed by waves and blown around by every wind of teaching. By human cunning and cleverness, somebody that's smarter than us knows just how to get us so that we join their little group and follow them and fall for any stupid thing they teach. This is Jonestown. This is the guy that went down in the fiery building. People were not mature spiritually. Some of them were old men. But they were not spiritually mature and they fell for this. But speaking in truth and love, let us grow in every way unto him who is the head, Christ. Let's grow up and have a little truth and love along the way. Because Christ is our head. From him the whole body, fitted and knitted together like this. Everything fits. It's not just everything fits. See, there's strength here. Okay. From him, the whole body fitted and knit together by every supported ligament promotes the growth of the body for building it up in love by proper working of each individual part. If every part of the body of Christ, you and I and preachers on television and preachers on the internet and preachers in their churches and special ministries that minister and outreaches to specific needs, if all of this do this together, we are every supporting ligament working together for the growth of the body. Who's the body again? All of us 
saints together, all of us that have been born again. The body of Christ, also known as the bride of Christ, building it up in love and proper working of each individual part. You know and I know how bad we feel when one part of us isn't working. I don't know, I think it was Wednesday night after the program, I went down to do something with the birds downstairs and I bent over and I pulled something. Only one little muscle. But even occasionally today, I get in the wrong position and I feel it. We need the whole body working together. You've seen people come on, usually as guests, <laughs> onto our um, Bible study on the Internet and make snide remarks. As somebody came on the other day, typed out a comment about women preachers. I can almost guarantee you this person went and told all his Christian friends, well, I told that woman preacher, I straightened her out, okay, I sure did. See, the body of Christ should work together. You don't all have to be in the same place and do the same thing. I interpret everything the exact same way. But listen, if we're the body of Christ... We shouldn't be hurting another part of the body of Christ. It doesn't work that way. Unless you're one of those that thinks that you and yours are the only ones that are going to go to heaven. In which case, like many others, you're going to be really surprised, first of all, by who doesn't make it. And also equally surprised in who does make it. promotes the growth of the body for the building up in love and proper working of each individual part. We're now in verse 17. Therefore I say this, testify in the Lord, you should no longer walk as the Gentiles walk. Wait a minute, he's talking to a gen he's talking to Gentiles. What do you mean you're a Gentile? Don't walk like a Gentile. You should no longer walk as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their thoughts. They are darkened by their understanding. Now, these are Gentiles, but they're born-again Gentiles. They're trying to live a Christian life. They just don't understand it all, and that's why Paul has to write to them. And remember from where he's writing? The Mamertine prison? Um, I was reading last night about Rome. I specifically wanted information on how was Rome at the particular Christ time that Jesus was writing to the Romans because of how he attacked a certain segment of that population so strongly in the first chapter. I'm thinking there must be some unusual sin that we're ignorant of because he just opens the book, says this is Paul, and gets right at it and calls a group of people in abomination. And I thought, something must be going on. I need to study and see what it is. And he says, um, you should no longer walk as the Gentiles walk. What is a Gentile? A Gentile is a non-Jew. But see, God provided for non-Jews too. And he sent them Paul. They're in, darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of ignorance. And because of the ignorance that's in them, and because of the hardness of their hearts. So there's stuff they don't know. Partly because they're ignorant, haven't been told, and partly because their hearts are hard and they're not interested in knowing. They became callous and gave themselves over to promiscuity for the practice of every kind of impurity 
with a desire for more and more. The word um, promiscuity, he mentions every kind of impurity. I think a word that we would probably use is the word fornication. Fornication is an umbrella word. Everything under the umbrella was a sin that had something that was some kind of sexual sin. It was not the sin of murder. It was not the sin of giving, uh, testifying falsely. It was not the sin of, of beating somebody. It was not some other sin. But any kind of sin that had to do with any kind of sexuality was called fornication. And he refers to that here. He said they just gave themselves over to it. This is getting us ready for the beginning of the book of Romans. Just gave themselves over to it with a desire for more and more. The more they got, the more they wanted. In other words, it wasn't a need that had to be filled. Because they never got full. They wanted more and more and more. And that's the way addiction is. A little of it, regardless of what it is. Whatever, whether it's pornography, whether it's drunkenness, whatever, it, a little doesn't seem to do it. But more and more and more and more. But that's not how you learned about the Messiah. Assuming you heard him and were taught by him, the Messiah, because the truth is in Jesus, you took off, think of taking off a coat. You took off your former way of life. Former way of life, cussing, cheating people. Bad habits, all things that aren't pleasing to God, take it off, throw it away. Don't even lay it aside. Take it to the dump because you don't want to put it back on again. Assuming you heard him, Jesus, and were taught by him, Jesus, because the truth is in Jesus, you took off your former way of life, the old man, that is corrupted by deceitful desires. Not only desires. See, some desires are good. You got to desire food. Because some people don't get hungry. Not most. Most of us are the other way. Uh, but you have some corrupted desires. You are being renewed in the spirit of your minds. Take it off, throw it away, and then let your mind begin new ways of thinking, new things that you desire. You put on a new man. The one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity and truth. You were an old man. Now that's not old in age. That's old in the things you did. And now you are a new man. Now you do different things. Verse 25. Since you put away lying and you speak the truth to your neighbor, because we're members one of another, you know, your hand and my foot are members of the body of Christ. Since you put away lying, speak the truth, each one to his neighbor, because we're members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. How do you get angry and do not sin? Well, you get angry at Satan. Not at people. He's a fallen angel. He got tired of leading worship in heaven, decided he wanted to be worshipped. Well, he had a revolution, got kicked out, landed on earth. The next time we see him, he's in the Garden of Eden saying to Eve, 
Did God tell you you couldn't eat from that tree? I don't think so. You can be angry at sin. You can be angry at a system that allows it. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. By the way, many marriage psychologists and marriage counselors use this verse. Get angry during the day. Don't go to bed mad. Get it taken care of before you go to sleep. Don't give the devil an opportunity. The thief must no longer steal. Instead, he must do honest work with his own hands so he has something to share with everybody that needs something. Don't steal. Go out and get a job. Save your money. Buy what you need. And you'll even have a little left over in case somebody needs something. You can help them out. No rotten talk should come from your mouth. By the way, I'm reading this particular version, the Holman Standard, um, Christian Standard Bible, because it's my understanding that this was translated, the thought was translated, not the word. And you've heard me go off on words that either have so many other words, can be translated so many ways that you dare not use them. Many of you know I'm a former court uh, interpreter. Um, the words that I translated had to be so precise. Money was on the line. If you're working in criminal court, somebody's liberty or even life might be on the line. And this particular version translates the thought, not the word. Many people think that every word in English has an exact translation in Spanish, French, um, German, Swedish, name it. It's not so. Sometimes it takes three or four words to explain one. Sometimes there is one word. But you all know that one word sometimes can have two or three meanings. So this version is translating thoughts. That's why I like, as, as a former interpreter, that's why I like this version. Um, no rotten talk should come out of your mouth, but only what is good for the building up of someone in need in order to give grace to those who hear, those who want to listen to the gospel. And don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. Don't sadden. Remember in Genesis 1 and 2, God said, God the Father said to God the Son, let us make man in our image. You can get your feelings hurt. I can get my feelings hurt. God can get his feelings hurt. How do we know? Because I know what people are like, and people are made in the image of God. Not how long is our nose, what color is our eyes, how thin is our hair, but what are we like? We can have our feelings hurt, and so can God. Do you ever think that you might be hurting God's feelings? That's a horrible thought. Something I'm sure you would never want to do. But sometimes we're not even aware that we can do that. Don't grieve God's Holy Spirit who sealed you till the day of your redemption. All bitterness, anger, wrath, insult, slander must be removed from you along with all wickedness. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. 
I would like to go to chapter 5. We're into this video already 40 minutes. I think I will do this because I would like to have only one chapter remaining in this book. So let me hasten on. Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children. You know somebody you admire and you want to imitate them? Have you seen little children imitate adults? The way they walk, the way they do it. They've been watching their mama. I learned to drive that way. My dad had very little that he had to do to teach me to drive. I watched him all the time. I watched everything he did. I wanted to be just like him. Just like we want to be like people we admire. Be imitators of God. Walk in love as Messiah also loved us and gave himself for us. A sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. What is a fragrant offering to God? In the tabernacle and in the temple, just a few steps in front of the veil, the one that was ripped from top to bottom, right after the moment that Jesus said, it is finished. Um, and the veil of the temple ripped. There was an altar. It was square. It was made of gold. Incense was burnt there. It reminds us of the prayers of the saints. But that incense had a sweet savor. Just like something we eat has a sweet flavor, what we smell can have a sweet savor. And that perfumed savor would go through the veil which was made up of several curtains into the presence of God. Sexual immorality and any impurity or greed should not be heard of among you. Just don't do it. Whether it's premarital sex among the unmarried, whether it's adultery among the married, regardless of what kind of sexual impropriety. Don't do it, he says. Immo sexual immorality and any impurity or greed should not even be heard of among you as is pro uh should not be heard among you as is proper for saints. And coarse and foolish talk or crude joking is not suitable. There's just some stuff that's not right and nobody has to explain it to you. You know it. But rather, instead of all that, what do you do? Giving thanks. For know and recognize this. No sexual immortal I've got to back up. That was not immortal. Knowing and recognize this. No sexually immoral or impure or greedy person who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of the Messiah and of God. I'm going to read it again, and I don't have to explain it because there isn't a single word here we don't understand. I mispronounced one, and I'm going to correct that. There's not a word here that needs any explanation. There's a, we understand every word here. No sexually immoral or impure or greedy person who is an idolater or who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of the Messiah of God. Now we go to verse 6, light versus darkness. Let no one deceive you with empty arguments because of these things. God's wrath is coming disobedient. Therefore, do not become their partners. It can't be light and dark at the same time. 
You turn on the light and the darkness goes. You turn off the light and it's dark. Can't have both. They cannot exist at the same time. Do not become their partners. You were once in darkness, but now you are the light of the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light results in goodness, righteousness, truth, discerning what is pleasing to the Lord. Don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness, but instead expose them. How do you expose them? You say, no, that's wrong. I can't do that. That's wrong. No, God doesn't want me doing that. Call something by its real name. Expose it. For it's shameful even to mention what is done by them in secret. Oh, listen. What we know about people, what we see people do openly, that's just the outside. Anything you see on the outside, know that there is an inside that you're not seeing. But everything exposed by the light is made clear. For what makes everything clear is light. Therefore it said, get up, sleeper, and rise up from the dead, and Messiah will shine on you. Now we get to verse 15. We have about 17 verses to go. And I'm pleased that I'm going to be able to finish this tonight so that next week we will do chapter 6 of Ephesians and then we will be next week, Lord willing, in chapter 1 of Romans. Pay careful attention then to how you walk. Not as unwise people, don't walk like dumb people, walk like wise people. Making the most of the time because the days are evil. Don't waste your time. We're not in the greatest days. And God needs us to work for him. Make the most of your time because the days are evil. Don't be foolish. Instead of being foolish, understand what God's will is. I talked about that this morning. How can anybody not want God's will? He knows more than us. We are given choices. We want a job. We don't know what company is going to fold up. We don't need to no, know a big company today might not even exist next year. Why would we want to make the decisions? Wouldn't we want to leave decisions up to God since he knows everything and he loves us and wants the very best for us? Don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is and don't get drunk with wine. Why? Because that leads to reckless actions. It sure does. Driving under the influence. Uh, I'm thinking of somebody I was counseling not too long ago. She wouldn't have done what she did if she hadn't been plied with a little wine. When I was a young woman, there was a saying, uh, supposedly a saying among guys, but I heard it from women. Candy's dandy, but liquor's quicker. You want a girl to cooperate with you, and you're afraid she's going to say, no way, Jose. Candy's dandy. But give her a little wine. Instead of that, be filled with the Spirit. Verse 19. Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to each other in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing and making music to the Lord in your heart. This is more important than you think. You have no idea how music affects your lives. I'm not kidding. 
you listen to the wrong music all day and you're going to be discouraged. I was driving cross country and years ago. Had the radio on, driving at night. And radio reception gets better at night. And I heard a song. Got tears in my ears for laying in my back while I'm crying over you. All you need to do is listen to that music all day long. And you're not going to get cheered up. But you sing the old songs of Zion. You're laying there in the morning in that moment when you're not quite asleep and not quite awake. And you hear a record you left on all night without realizing it. And you're just barely waking up and you hear amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now am found was blind but now I see you can wake up and feel good I guarantee it once in a while I fall asleep watching television and it's usually Christian television. It might be news or something. I fell asleep once with Fox Radio on and there was news about a fire and people getting killed. And I, I woke up and I, what, what, where am I? What's going on? Now, let me wake up if I have left Christian television on and I fall asleep. or It's during the day and I'm tired. If I haven't slept well the night before or something and I fall off for a couple of minutes. But I wake up. Jesus loves me. This I know. It, it changes your day. I guarantee it. On the other hand, you put junk on the radio. I got tears in my ears. That's how you're going to feel. If you're tempted to do something, and you got music on in the background. That's going to push you a little bit in one direction or the other. Singing and making music to the Lord in your heart. With psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Verse 20. Giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Remember fear is respect. The fear of the Lord is being in awe of the Lord. Respecting him for who he is. And this verse says submitting to each other in the fear of Christ. Now he gets a little bit to wives and husbands. And I've got just a few verses and I can do it in the next few minutes. Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, you guys know that I'm a very strong woman. Can you see me submitting myself to a man? Well, let's find out what kind of a man we're talking about. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Now, as the church submits to Christ... So, wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Ooh, that's tough language for a strong woman like me. But I could do that. I'll tell you why. Even a strong woman that doesn't take no guff off nobody can do that if verse 25, here it comes, husbands, Love your wives. Just as also Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Jesus loved us, the church, the body of Christ, so much he died for us. Now, you show me a man that loves me 
that much, I don't have trouble submitting. I don't have trouble submitting to God. I don't have trouble submitting to Christ, to His will. I'm not going to submit to some stupid fool that doesn't know brown from black. That was a dumb illustration, but I was talking to a friend just the other day, and uh, I was talking to a doctor about black, and the doctor was wearing a stethoscope, and he said, do you know the difference? And he held up the black of the rubber of the stethoscope. He says, this is black. Now, do I know the difference? And that popped into my mind. When I said black from brown, I wasn't talking about races. You give me some ignoramus that doesn't know nothing and is going to tell me what to do. And he doesn't know high from low, go from come. No way I'm going to follow him. You give Christian women a man that loves her as much as Jesus loves the church enough to die for her. We got no problem. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of the water of the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor. In Christ's eyes, we're beautiful. We put on that white wedding dress. We're supposed to wear white. Remember that was the deal in the Old Testament. Fathers, keep your daughters pure. That's the deal in the New Testament. Church, keep yourself pure. Don't show up ready for a wedding with spots all over your wedding gown. Don't show up at the door of heaven having lived like a woman of the world. Be pure. Keep yourself holy. You want to spend eternity with Christ? In the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. Show me a man that doesn't like himself. He who loves his wife loves himself. This is getting us ready for Romans 1. This is what life is supposed to be like. You love each other. You cherish each other. Together, you are one. The two shall become one. This is the way. For no man ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church. Since we're members of his body, all of us Christians, so don't some of you come in here saying stupid stuff and pretending to be part of the church of Christ. You come here, act like part of the Christian family. We're all member of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. It's not a husband plus a wife. No. One husband plus one wife equals a couple. You're no longer her. You're part of a couple. This mystery is profound, says Paul in verse 32. But I'm talking about Christ and the church. To sum it up, 
Each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. And only five minutes past my regular time. And uh, next Sunday night, or second service, uh, we will be with children and their parents, slaves and masters, Christian warfare, and Paul's final farewell to the church in Ephesus. I'm going to close our video because it's already an hour for those that are watching it. I don't know if I made two videos that were 30 minutes each, if that would be better. But this follows our teachers. And as soon as I do what I have to do here on YouTube to close this video, I will be right back with my viewers. And we'll continue with our class. Hang on. And you out there in YouTube land, <laughs> until our next video, blessings on you.